And it's always a privilege and a joy to be able to start our services with Believer's Baptism. And this morning, we have one young man coming. This is Caleb Parker. And Caleb uh, accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior this past December, on the 23rd of December. And so this morning, Caleb comes in obedience to Believer's Baptism. Caleb, what is your confession? Um, to accept, to accept Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right, face this way. It's upon that public profession of faith that I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. stand together as we begin our time of worship together.
pray together. Father, thank you for calling us to worship your holy name this moment. And Father, we pray that you would continue to give us the desire to desire you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength as individuals, Father, and as a family that's called Ridgecrest and for our guests as well. God, we love you. And we pray now that your name is lifted high above anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated and welcome to worship this morning, especially those who may be our guests. And if you are a guest, possibly for the first time or perhaps for the first time in a long time, would you do us a favor and introduce yourself or reintroduce yourself to us by simply tearing this little tab on the back part of your worship folder. Hopefully you received one on your way in this morning and give us that information. You can drop it in the uh, offering baskets during that part of our worship. Or the best option is go to our welcome center. You'll go out that door, look to your left, or down the main hallway. We'll be on the right. We have some volunteers there ready to meet you and have a gift for you and some information about who we are as a church family. We'd love to see you there after worship and uh, even get you to a connection group once you meet us there. So could, please come by and see us. Hey, just, just a, a bit of information in case you hadn't noticed already, we do have a couple special guests with us with our Freedom Campaign, and they are going around, and you will always be on TV here. So uh, smile big for them, and they're just getting some footage to help us with the promotion of our Freedom Campaign. Pastor will tell you about that more as he comes this morning. But just uh, notice they'll be throughout our connection groups and throughout our campus. Make them feel welcome this morning as well to Ridgecrest Baptist Church. Brother Tim, Let's you lead. Let's stand together and welcome each other this morning.
This I believe.
Father, our desire today is to praise you and you alone because you have lifted us. You have forgiven us. You have given us life through your son, Jesus. And we praise you and thank you for that. Our desire today is to lift high your name and to worship you with all that we are so that then from there we can live lives of worship day in and day out where you use us for your glory. God bless this time now as we give. Strengthen us to cheerfully give back to you as you so richly given to us. And then multiply these tithes and these offerings so that our church can continue to fulfill your mission and take the name of Jesus to the ends of the world. Above everything, God, again, we praise you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, I'm glad you're here today to worship, and uh, let's continue to do just that uh, by looking at God's Word. Take your Bibles and open up, if you will, to Romans chapter 4. And while you're finding that, let me just remind you of something, and that is next Sunday uh, is Vision Sunday. And uh, that relates, of course, to our freedom campaign, and I'm going to bring you a special message on vision and uh, what God has for us, and, and I'll give you a, a some clarification on what our freedom campaign is all about uh, in the first few minutes uh, of our time uh, next uh, week. So I hope that you will be here for that. And I'm going to share something with you that I wrote in July of 2001, but have kept it private all of these years. And I'm going to share it. Uh, the Lord has given me liberty to share it with you, and I'm going to share that with you uh, next uh, Sunday morning. So I hope that you will be here uh, and join us uh, for that. Now, you know, generally speaking, when we uh, use the word faithfulness, we use it as uh, in uh, the context of like being faithful to a spouse. Maybe it's being faithful to your job. Could be faithful to friends. It might be used in the context of being faithful to your church, uh, even faithful to God. And all of those are good things. But let me clarify something this morning, and that is that being faithful doesn't necessarily mean that you are walking by faith. In other words, you can be faithful in the routines of life and yet never actually live and walk by faith. Uh, you can be faithful in life. You get it? You can be faithful to the, the relationships and the, the details of your life. You can be faithful in all of those things and yet not live by faith. But listen to this. But you cannot live by faith and not be faithful. You can be faithful and not live by faith but you can't live by faith and not be faithful. Some of you know the name of William Booth. William Booth was greatly stirred by the needs of the poor in London, and he realized that most churches were doing very little to reach what uh, many called the undesirables, uh, drunken, uh, uh, the drunks, uh, morphine addicts, uh, prostitutes, and, and uh, the poor. And so he set out uh, to reach them with what he called the three S's, soup, soap, and salvation. And under his work, thousands were saved among those that most churches uh, really had no interest in reaching. Uh, in fact, Booth gave his life for this cause of reaching people, and thousands upon thousands upon thousands were reached during his ministry. But in his 80s, his work began to be hindered. It was hindered because of his uh, blindness. Uh, he lost his sight, and then he regained it, and then he permanently uh, lost it. And on one occasion, his son, his son was named Bramwell, Bramwell came to talk with his father, William Booth, and he said, Dad, I need to tell you some bad news. The doctors say now that there's no hope of you ever regaining your sight. You will be blind uh, for the rest of your life. And when Bramwell told his father, William Booth, those uh, words, William Booth replied to his son with this. He said, well, son, God knows best. I have done what I could do for God and the people with my eyes, and now I will do what I can for God and the people without my eyes. You know, I love that story because it is a perfect illustration of what faith and faithfulness working together look like. You see, a living faith is utterly trusting in God at all times. A living faith trusts the things that are seen and understood. And a living faith trusts the things that are not seen and not understood. A living faith says that I trust that God knows best. And this morning, that's what I want to talk with you about. And so if you have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 4, I would invite you to stand with me as we begin reading in the 16th verse. This is what Paul writes. He says, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, 
as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. And it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And we thank you in particular, God, for the faith that you have uh, uh, offered to us, the relationship that you have offered to us by faith. And we thank you, Father, that today in this place we can express our faith, but also, Father, that we can respond to you by faith. And Lord, I pray that you'll open your word to our hearts and to our minds and cause us, Father, to get what you have for us. Speak to us, Lord, and when you do, cause our hearts to say a resounding yes, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. Now in this passage, Paul is talking about two expressions of faith. He's talking about a saving kind of redemptive faith, and he's talking about what in particular I want to talk with you about today. He's talking about a living faith, and he uses Abraham as an example of both of these. In other words, Abraham demonstrated a living faith that produced a faithful life and a spiritual example for all of us about how faith redeems us and then how faith affects the way that we live our lives. Now, there is a lot of confusion about the term faith in our world today. For example, sometimes the word of faith is used to denote a religious system. You know, like, what faith are you or the faith? Sometimes it's used to denote simple belief, as in, well, I believe something is true. And when we use it that way, we mean an intellectual kind of faith. I believe something in my head to be true. But the most biblical expression of faith is faith as a verb, meaning that it is demonstrated in our activity. It's demonstrated in our response to circumstances, and it's demonstrated in the details of our life. And when we use it that way, we're talking about a faith that is alive, a living faith, because it affects all of who we are and what we do. Now, to start with this morning, what I want to show you are a couple of things that faith is not. Living faith is not a couple of things, and, and Paul tells us what those are in this passage. The first is that living faith is not weakened by physical circumstances. If you look there at verse 19, it says about Abraham, he is our model. Paul is using him as that, that for us. He says he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. Uh, Abraham was not weak in faith despite thinking about his own physical limitations. You see, he had been given a word from God that he was going to be the father of of a great nation, and yet he was 100 years old. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out, and yet God told him, said, you're going to be the father of a great nation, and <clears throat> Abraham didn't say, there's no way, God. He didn't say, it can't be done, God, but what Paul says is that his faith didn't weaken. Yours might have, mine might have, if we'd have been given some kind of uh, uh, what appears to be physically impossible uh, responsibility or task but not Abraham. His faith didn't weaken. His body was now dead. Did you notice it called his, his, it says his body is dead. The word dead here in the Greek is in the perfect participle. And, and it means this, that Abraham could never have a son. It was humanly impossible. That's, what, that's what's being said. Abraham knew that physiologically it was impossible what the assignment God had given to him. Now listen, don't forget that because there are going to be times in your life where you're going to think, God, what you expect of me is impossible. And God knows that it's impossible. But God never asks you to do the impossible without being the God of the possible in your life. And Abraham's faith was not weakened. 
uh, by the responsibility and the task that he was given. And here's the deal, living, living faith is never weakened by life's limitations or circumstances. As you live out your faith, trusting completely and wholly on Jesus Christ, listen, your faith does not have to grow weak. It can actually do what Abraham's did. Did you notice on down? It said that his faith actually got stronger. Now, I'm not suggesting when you face some impossible circumstances that those circumstances do not play a role in God's plan for your life. There may be some things that you encounter in life and you say, these circumstances, uh, there's, no, there's no way around them. Now listen, I'm not saying that God never uh, brings circumstances or allows circumstances in your life uh, that uh, are, are not a part of his plan to help you decide what the next step is. But we have to be careful that we don't ignore what God may be doing. Sometimes he may use the circumstances to point you in a direction. Sometimes he may give you circumstances that are impossible so that you will see his possible power in your life. But how do you know the difference, right? How do you know when the, the circumstances you're facing are uh, the means by which God is just trying to orient you in a different way? And how do you know when the impossible circumstances are the opportunity for God in your life? Well, that's a good question. Let me give you the answer. And here's the key. You see, Abraham had faith over his circumstances, impossible, we're all agreed about that, right? Abraham had faith over his circumstances, not because he, uh, he was capable to pull this off. He had, he had uh, a faith over his circumstances because he'd been given a promise from God. And that's how you and I know how to differentiate what's going on with our circumstances. You see, if God has given us a promise, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Hello? If God has given you a word, and I'll talk a little more about this later on, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, uh, no matter how impossible they seem. Because with God, all things are possible, the scripture says. So the difference is for us is when we face those impossible circumstances, like Abraham, we have to rely on what has God told me instead of just the circumstances. So even though Abraham's physical circumstances said there's no way, his faith in the word that God had given him said, way. His faith in the, the, the word that God had given him said, it's going to happen. One of our greatest struggles is not allowing our circumstances to weaken our faith. Isn't it true? We have a tendency to live by sight. And um, in Matthew, you remember Jesus said to, to those who came to him and said, uh, with man, what you're looking at is impossible. They said, how can this happen? But he said, with God, all things are possible. And so living faith is not weakened by circumstances. All right, here's the second thing living faith is not. Living faith is not, uh, does not waver or doubt God's promises. It doesn't weaken and it doesn't waver. Look, go on down if you will. Uh, verse 20, look back at your Bible. It says, no unbelief... Lack of faith, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. So you see there's a connection between his faith and the promise of God. And he didn't waver, he didn't doubt. The word waver there in the Greek uh, means to contend or to challenge or to dispute. The point is, <clears throat> Abraham didn't question God's ability to do exactly what he said. He didn't say to him, he may have said, God, I, I don't know that I can pull this off, but God, I know you can. He didn't waver. He didn't challenge God. He didn't say, there's no way, God. Don't you understand what's going on here? There's no way this can happen. You know, sometimes we miss out on the power of God in our life because we waver. We, we have a word from God, but we think, God, I don't see how that's going to work out. Do you know what wavering is all about? It's about living by sight. But he didn't argue with God. He was fully convinced of God's power. Verse 21 uh, tells us that. Look, he was fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. He was fully convinced of God's power to fulfill his promise and to perform the impossible on his behalf. Charles Spurgeon once said this, he said, I would recommend you either believe God up to the hilt or else not to believe him at all. I, I would recommend you believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it. 
He said, there's no logical standing place between the two. He said, be satisfied with nothing less than a faith that swims in the depths of divine revelation. Because a faith that paddles about the edge of the water is poor faith at best. Now let me clarify something for you this morning. We're not talking about having faith for the sake of faith. There's a popular notion in our age, and it's just this. It goes like, well, just believe in something. You've heard that, haven't you? Uh, It doesn't matter as long as you have faith in something. Have faith, believe in something. We oftentimes, when we see some tragedy uh, uh, occur in our nation, we'll hear people say, just believe in something. It's just important. Everybody believe something. As if faith in faith can work the work of God. That's not what we're talking about. It's not the the example of Scripture, and it's not the the testimony of Abraham here. Believing, just believing in something, uh, anything, is not going to do something for you. It's an unbiblically substantiated position. You see, living faith does not waver. It doesn't waver because it's focused on an object. You ever heard this line, well, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to follow God because I, I, it, I, I don't believe in blind faith. It's blind faith. You, listen, Christianity is not blind faith. And let me tell you why it's not blind faith, because we have a very clear object of our faith. Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, these are objects of our faith. So when we are, we are living the life of faith, we have put our focus on God, on His Son, Jesus Christ. It's not blind faith. It's not taking a leap uh, off into nothingness. In fact, I would suggest to you that much of the faith of the world is more blind faith than anything. But, but so uh, uh, a living faith doesn't waver because it's focused on an object. It, that object is Jesus Christ. Uh, a living faith doesn't waver because it's founded on a promise. See, he, he fully believed that God was capable of fulfilling and carrying out the promise that he had given. It is founded on a promise. It is founded on what God has said. It is founded on the statements of God himself. So living faith is both a strong faith, that is, it's not weakened by circumstances, and it is a solid faith, that is, it doesn't waver on God's promises. It believes everything God has said. And with that as background, now here's what I want to do. I want to show you some of the things that happen because of a living faith. What does a living faith uh, faith result in? Let me show you some things this morning. First of all, we see it in verse 17, a living faith gets to experience the presence of God. The presence of God is a product of living faith. God saved us to restore us to himself. You know, Jesus came into this world to restore you to God, to your relationship with with God. God wants a relationship with you. And he wants a personal relationship. He doesn't want a casual relationship. He doesn't want a relationship where where you can say, well, I, I know who God is. No, he wants you to say, I know God personally, up close and personal. That's the whole reason Jesus came into this world. God loves you so much. He wants that kind of up close and personal relationship. He wants you to have that dynamic in the relationship. God saved us to restore us. God wants you, listen to this, God wants you to live in his presence. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned? Do you remember what they lost? The, the, they were cast out of the garden. What did they lose? They lost the immediate presence of God that they had known. And that's why Jesus again came. He came to restore what was lost there and what has been lost because because of our sin nature. Jesus paid for our sins so that we could be rightly restored and related and so that we could live in the presence of God. Jesus told us this in, in John. He says, abide in me. You know what that's about? He said, just as I abide in the Father. I abide in the Father, you abide in me. And guess what? He says, I'm in the presence of the Father. You uh, can be in that presence too by extension, by relationship. You can live and abide in the presence of God. Abiding is trusting completely in Him. It's depending on Him as a source of life. And I learned to do that. How do I learn to do it? By dying to myself and putting my faith in Him and Him alone. Did you notice in verse 17, go back and look at verse 17, did you notice the connection between presence and belief? It says, in the presence of the God 
whom he, what class? He believed, whom he had put his faith in. That's a living faith. And a living faith connects us, listen, to the presence of God. Why is that? Well, listen to how the author of Hebrews described it. He says, because without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near, see that's presence, okay, draw near. Whoever would draw near to God must believe. That's faith that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. You see, living faith connects us personally into the presence of God. Faith, it is living faith that enables us to experience who God is on the ultimate level. But secondly, I want you to see this in verse 17 as well. A living faith also gets to see the power of God. It doesn't just get to enter the presence of God. A living faith gets to see the power of God. Look at verse 17. It says, uh, after it says, in the presence of God in whom he believed, then notice this statement, who gives life to the dead. Paul's reminding us that living faith gets to see God do what only God can do. Here's a fact. If you abide in the presence of God, you will most definitely get to see the power of God displayed. Abraham in verse 19 acknowledged that he and Sarah were dead in their ability to bring forth a son. But his faith saw God as the one who can give, do you see it, life to the dead. We're dead, he said, but God can call forth, bring forth life from the dead. There are occasions in the Old Testament Scripture where we see the bones being raised up. Where There are occasions where, where we see God saying that I will make a way where there is no way. Abraham understood that. And he understood that he could take the bodies of him and Sarah and perform an absolute miracle through his mighty power. Every promise made by God is a promise that only God can fulfill. Now let me tell you why that is. Every promise made by God to you is a promise that only God can fulfill. Do you know why that is? Because if you can pull it off, it's not a God thing. If you can make it happen, then God isn't needed in your life. So when God gives you a promise, it is almost exclusively a promise that he alone can pull off in your life. Your faith connected to God's promises enables God's power. Let me say that again. Your faith connected to God's promises enable God's power in your life. You see, faith is a catalyst to God's power. How do we know that? Well, the scripture is very clear about that. You remember the occasion where Jesus returned to Nazareth? That was where he grew up in Nazareth. And he, he went there, and of course, the people didn't recognize him for who he really was. And the scripture says in Matthew 13 uh, that he did not do many mighty works there. Why? Because it says of their unbelief, their lack of faith. You see, faith is a catalyst to God's power. What does God want you to do in your life? What does he want to do in your life that is being restricted by your unbelief? Let me ask it another way. What has God given you a promise about? What has God very clearly spoken to you about that he wants to do in your life, but your lack of belief, your unbelief in his promise has limited his power on your behalf? You see, Christ's power in our life is attached to two things. It's attached to His Word, and it's attached to your faith. It's attached to His Word, what He said to you, and it's attached to your faith and what He said. Now, don't confuse this with a lot of folks today who would just tell us, well, you just name something and claim it by faith, and it has to happen. The work of God is associated with the Word of God. All right? And so that's how you know how to determine the promises of God that He's delivered to you in His Word. And so you take the promises that He's delivered to you, and when they get personal and, uh, and specific, and you know God has given you 
a powerful personal word, then your faith is the catalyst that causes the word of God to enable, uh, uh, your faith enables the power of God to respond to his word. That's why he couldn't do anything in Nazareth, because they didn't believe. You say, yeah, but that's, that's Abraham. That's Abraham. Is God's power really accessible to me? Well, let me answer it this way. Paul said, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places? Do you get what Paul is saying? You say, I I believe the power of God could operate for Abraham or some other great patriarch or matriarch in in the scripture, some other famous disciple. I can see and understand how the power of God could work on their behalf, but not on mine. I'm me. I'm not Abraham. But Paul said, writing to these Ephesian Christians, do you not understand the incredible power and might of God? It raised Christ from the dead, but here's what he's saying to them. But it raised Christ from the dead, and it is available to you right now. The same power that brought forth our Savior from the grave is the same power that he wants you to know will operate in your life today. But it's by faith. We believe, and we surrender ourselves to that. Abraham's faith was in God and God alone. He didn't know what kind of method God was going to use to to bring about his promise. Or he didn't know how God would display his power. But he knew that God was able to do what God had promised. And because he believed God, he was fully persuaded that that promise from God would be fulfilled. And as a result, Abraham got to see the power of God of God manifested in his life and the lives of those around him. Well, that power, Paul says, is available to you and I. All right, so a living faith gets to experience the presence of God. It gets to see the power of God. And then third, I want you to notice that a living faith gets to hear the proclamation of God. Verse 17, again, it says, all right, follow along in the presence of God in whom he believed. That's the presence. Who gives uh, life to the dead. That's the power. And calls into existence. Calls into existence the things that do not exist. That's the proclamation. And this is closely akin to the previous matter that we've just talked about, faith and God's power. But it's worth noting for just a moment, living faith, you see, gets to to watch God declare, to, to, to hear God proclaim things that are not yet and then are. There's no explanation from a logical, rational worldly uh, viewpoint, there there are often times we can't describe, we can't explain it, but God called forth something that we can't explain. It wasn't, and it is, because God called it into existence. That is the proclamation of God, the call of God. The word call here is the word in the Greek that means to summon. So here's the picture of what's going on. God called Isaac into existence before he existed, as if he already existed. God summoned him. Isaac, Isaac wasn't there yet. Isaac, I'm going to call him into being before he was, as if he was. God called him. He summoned him into existence. He summoned Isaac. Abraham and Sarah got to hear the promise of God, and then they got to receive the product of God. Isaac was the product of the promise that was enabled by living faith. Here's the practical point for your life. Listen to me. When God makes a declaration, when he makes a proclamation in a promise to you, you treat that as true before you ever see it come true. Did you get that? When God makes a promise to you, 
you treat that promise as true before it ever becomes true as if it is true. And how do you do that? You can do that by thanking God in advance for what he has called into existence. How do you do that? Well, you adjust your life to the promise. You start living your life on the basis of the promise God has given you, even before the promise has become a reality, and then you give God thanks in advance. Now, maybe you say this morning, really, Pastor, really, I've got to thank God by faith before he fulfills the promise in order to receive the promise? Yes. When he gives you a word, when he gives you the promise, you say, thank you, I, I'm going to adjust my life to the promise. I'm going to live with the promise in view. I'm going to believe, yes. And you see, when you thank God afterward, you know what we do? If you say, well, it, 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 I promise when it happens, I'm going to give him uh, thanks. And uh, you know what we call that? We call that gratefulness when you give thanks on the backside. We, we call that uh, uh, gratefulness. But if you thank God on the front side, you know what we call that? We call that living faith. I'm going to thank him before he ever fulfills the promise that he has given. I thank you, God, for the promise that you have given me. And I want to tell you something. I've done this. I practice this. There's promises right now God has given me that I have thanked him for in advance, and I fully believe that I will see the fulfillment of those promises. I have thanked him in advance. Because to thank him after, and by the way, thank him afterwards too. It's, it's fine to be, be full of gratefulness to God. Be grateful to God for what he uh, has done. But listen, living faith learns to take the word that he has given, the promise that he has uh, handed to you, and to hold on to that promise with thankfulness on the front side. That's faith. That's living faith. But there's one more thing I want to show you this morning. And that is number four. I want you to see verse 18, number four, and that is a living faith gets to hold the promise of God. I love the statement, verse 18 says, in hope he believed against hope. Now, <clears throat> in the scripture, frequently is the word hope used like we use hope. We use hope in a wishful kind of way. I wish, I'm wishing for, I'm hoping for is how we often uh, use that word. But in the scripture, hope when that word is used, is, is frequently and most often used to denote uh, something that's solid. So it says he hoped against hope. All right, here's what he said. He believed in something that was unbelievable. You get that? He held on to this promise. He hoped against hope. He held on to something. He believed something that was unbelievable. You see, now, sometimes that's hard to do out in our world, sometimes in our life, but with God, because all things are possible, we can take the word that he gives us, the promise that he gives, hold the promise, even though the promise seems impossible, even to us. The point is this, the the point of the statement is this, that the deck was stacked against Abraham from man's viewpoint. I mean, nobody would have argued that Abraham and Sarah were going to have a kid. There's no way. This can't happen. Something's wrong with them. They're touched, you know. They're believing they're going to have a child. But he believed the unbelievable. And Abraham ignored his limitations, and by faith he held to the unlimited power and promise of God to him. I like the way uh, Pastor Rick Warren uh, put it. He said, faith is not believing God can do something. Faith is not hoping we will do, uh, that he will do something. Faith is thanking God in advance of what he will do. And then he describes it this way. Listen to this. This is good. He says, if someone handed you a check right now for $1,000, would you wait until you cashed it to say thank you? No, you would thank that person immediately. And uh, yet the $1,000 wouldn't really be yours until you actually cash the check. Because the check is simply a promise. And when you are given the check, you can genuinely say thanks, believing that the promise is credible. And that the person has enough money in the bank to cover that amount. And then he says this, what I'm saying is, 
If God tells you to go after Moby Dick in a rowboat, take the tartar sauce with you because you're going to have a fish fry. (laughs) Well, living faith is like that. It takes the promise of God, and it doesn't let go in spite of the limitations of life. In spite of what is around us that is, uh, appears to, to shut down any idea or any thoughts of what God has said. And you know your faith matters in the matter. We know that. G- the scripture says of Jesus, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it done. You see, all of us sooner or later have to decide whether or not we're going to trust God. Our faith matters. Everyone is uh, uh, trusting in something or someone. Everybody in this room today, you say, well, I haven't put my trust in God. Well, you're trusting something else. You're trusting your goodness or you're trusting your works. Or as I heard a governor some years ago in one of our southern states say, I'm trusting in a godly father and a godly mother to get me into heaven. It doesn't work that way. But everybody is trusting in something or someone. So the question is, what are you trusting in? Who are you trusting? Because who you are and what you become are a result of who you're trusting in. And what God can do in you and what God can do through you is about your faith. Do you have an intellectual faith that is limited only to what you know to be true right here? Or have you put your trust right here, the inner man? Have you surrendered your soul to God? I believe you, God, when I see. I believe you when I don't see. I believe you when I understand. I believe you when I don't understand. That's what Abraham said. See, God gave him a promise that was impossible for man, but completely possible with God. So Abraham had to make a choice. Will I trust God beyond my understanding? Will I trust God beyond what I can see? That's why the Bible tells us we walk by faith and not by sight. And so our faith, a living faith, determines what God can do through us and for us. This passage affirms that Abraham's living faith was the result of his redeeming faith. You see, it is, in the end, it is faith in Christ that makes the difference. Faith in Christ that makes the difference. And unless you and I surrender our life to him, the best we can ever have is just a faith that says up here, I believe certain things to be true. But life change happens when our faith moves from what we know to right here in the inner man. And if today you're in this place and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, did you know the reason he died was for you? He died, he paid our sins for our sins on the cross. And because he died for our sins, we can be restored. We can see the power of God working in our life. We can hear the voice of God speaking to us in our hearts. And all of that is because God loved you so much that he wanted a relationship with you. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to take your sin and my sin and hang on a cross. And then three days later, hallelujah, to be resurrected from the grave. If you've never trusted him, what are you waiting on? Give your life. That's redeeming faith, okay? That is what we call a saving faith. It's not based on your works. It's based on what he did. All you must do is receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. John writes in chapter 1 of his gospel. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's saving faith. And you can't have living faith until you first have saving faith. Does that make sense? So I want to invite you to bow with me and and pray. And I I want to invite you in this place today, if you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ, to do that. You can do it right where you're seated. You can say something in your heart to God like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, dying on the cross. The cross, God, I can never thank you enough for it. Instead of me dying on the cross for my sins, you died on the cross for my sins. And I invite you right now to forgive me and come into my life 
and be my Savior and my Lord and my Master. Not just someone I know about, but someone that I have a personal relationship with. Would you come into my life right now, Father? You, if you prayed that prayer right now, you can have the assurance that Jesus Christ has heard that prayer. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. And I would invite you, whether you're in the balcony or ground floor, if you prayed a prayer like that, there are going to be staff down here at the front. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to make you say anything. But we want to pray with you. And we want to help you get started in that new decision for Christ. Would you slip out? The Bible says, if you're not willing to confess me before men, I'll not confess you before my Father. Would you slip out this morning, walk down an aisle, take one of our staff members by the hand, and they'll get some information and pray with you about your wonderful new decision. Would you take that very seriously today? You may be here in this place this morning, and you say, you know what, I know Christ, but I haven't been living my faith. I've been living by my own opinions, my own ideas. I haven't been living and trusting and holding to the promises of God. But today, Lord, I, I return in terms of my faith. I don't want to just have head knowledge. I want to have a, a life knowledge. You may be here this morning and say, you know what? I've trusted Christ. I just need a church family, a church home. I want to invite you. If you are that person or person, would you slip out in just a moment? Come forward and, again, take one of our staff and just say, hey, I'd like to join Ridgecrest. I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ. I just want a family to be connected with. We'd love to have you in this place. Father, would you speak to us now in these moments of invitation? Father, speak. We're listening to you. And Lord, I pray that you will move and hearts will respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Brother Tim is going to lead us and uh, words are going to be on the screen. I would invite you to come and kneel before God at this altar. There's something powerful about kneeling before God. And it is a posture of, of prayer power. And maybe there's something or someone or some decision you need to make. You come and kneel. Use this altar. But as we sing, you slip out right now. You come on and make your decision. Well, today we've been talking about uh, what a living faith looks like. You know, there are a lot of things you can be faithful in but not live by faith. But when it comes to our relationship with God, it, it requires a depth of faith uh, to really know God and to experience His power and His presence and uh, the results of His promises. That's what we've been talking about. But during the course of today's message, perhaps you have discovered your own need for Christ as Savior. All of us need Christ. All of us need His saving work on the cross for us. But if you've never put your trust in Him, you may have believed in your head, but you've never trusted Him with your heart. Would you do that today? Right where you are, you can call on Him. You can pray a prayer something like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I know I'm a sinner, and I know that you died on the cross for my sins. Right now, I receive you. I invite you to come into my life and be my Savior. Transform my life. Be my Lord and my Master. Now, I can tell you, if you will pray a prayer something like that from your heart to Him, He will hear it. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And John writes and tells us this, but as many as received them, to him he gave the right to become children of God. I hope you'll do that today. And if you have prayed a prayer to receive Christ, we'd love to help you get started in your new journey with Christ. You'll see contact information on the screen in front of you. Let us know about your decision. We'd love to send you some free growth material to get you moving in the right direction. And then, of course, I want to invite you and all of those who are watching, if you do not have a church home, to come and visit with us here at Ridgecrest. On Sunday mornings, we have two worship services. We have an 815. We call it a blended style worship. It has a praise and a hymns. It has choir, orchestra. And then at 1050, we have a more contemporary venue. It's called our live service. It's band driven. It's very casual, very relaxed. And that may be more to your liking. But in either case, I'm going to share with you the same message from God's word. And we'd love to have you uh, visit with us here at Ridgecrest. And speaking of visiting, why not visit our website? www.rbcdothan.org. Uh, there you'll find a lot of information about uh, Ridgecrest. You'll find information about the various ministries uh, that we have here. And you can connect with us through streaming, through podcasting, video on demand. All of those things are there. And a lot of helpful resources. So I hope you'll check our website out as well. And then be sure to like us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we have a presence on all of those, and we'd like for you to be one of our followers. So we hope you'll do that as well.
Well, I hope you've been encouraged and blessed by the Word of God today. It's been my joy to share it with you, and I look forward to doing that again next week on this channel at this same time. I hope you'll join us again. Until then, may God bless you.